place to the minutes. Okay, it's going to be uploaded there. Okay. Now it's recording. Can you see the presentation now? Yes, yes. today I, I can see it. Yes, I can. Ah, thank you. Good. Well, active learning is also, is also known as constructivism, but, you know, this is the introduction of social constructivism, which is a different theory, okay? So let's focus on active learning so that we can separate, discriminate both theories. I decided to start with active learning because, believe it or not, Piaget's work is still current this day and age, and it's still current for pedagogical implications, for making decisions, for implementations, for curriculum design, for syllabus design, and more importantly, it's got a connection between the language learning theories we just checked a couple of days ago, you know, I think it was last week, and it's got a connection with methods in approaches, okay? So this is the place of teaching and learning processes. And on your right, you have the methods and approaches for teaching and learning. And on your left, you got the language acquisition theories and language learning theories. So it's important to have this approach where we can see, you know, around to actually know what we are doing and what is happening with these processes. So today we're going to focus on active learning. Before going, th uh, going through active learning, it's important to set the conclusions we together reach. Okay, we all together decided and stated that every student is unique. How did we do it? Well, because you provided with a, your learner identity brainstorm. Remember? Yeah. I check it, I comment it. You explored your own processes, you explore your background, your learn and teaching experiences were there, and your characteristics. So the conclusion might be that everybody is different. Another conclusion for, from, from the factors that may affect learning and a, for your comparative charts regarding EFL and ESL and for the differences between acquisition and learning processes is that the context makes a difference. It does make a difference with regard to age, with regard to gender, with regard to proficiency level, with regard to background, to personal history, individuality, the context makes a difference regarding the curriculum, the syllabus, the approach, the instructor, the teacher, the attitude, the aptitude, the cognitive skills, the issues of power or perceptions on language or perceptions of the English language, etc. Okay. So we now have all this umbrella with the elements that make up the differences and the variables among students, learners. It's a turning point for us because without it, you know, we, um, we would be in danger of, you know, teaching in a, in a, let's say, in an effective way, okay? We want our teaching and we want to know our learning first and foremost. We want to know about our learning processes. And then we want our teaching to be contextualized and we want our teaching to be suitable, okay? We want the students to learn, that's the purpose. And if they don't learn, it's because our teaching needs to be worked on because of many different reasons. Well, your observations at the moment, I really think you uh, are pre-service teachers, regardless of your job, because I know some of you will be translators, 
some other interpreters, researchers, writers, um, editors, or um, um, you know, um, the different jobs, right? But at the moment, you are pre-service teachers because you are actually shedding light on your learning processes. You are designing activities and carrying out tasks that it, to a certain extent might be uh, helpful for the future for your pon potential implementations and because you are in the reflective process okay you are now able to identify the variety of contexts for learning and teaching and that's to enhance development of language I also want to share a couple of statements for you to reflect on the context differences and the learner variables. For example, according to Cameron, who is a researcher who focused on children's language learning, um, first language acquisition is largely complete at the age of five. This might be true or false. But there are some implications and things around which we need to study. Some structures in a spoken language are acquired late, and some literacy skills are need to be worked out. You know, they need to be worked out. It's a process to actually integrate the skills. Additionally, these core skills continue to develop through elementary school, high school, senior high school, and we could even say that at the university level, at least in the Mexican education system, just because we start developing academic discourse skills, you know, and, and, and we employ higher register, a, a, we start taking care of, you know, academic stuff. So it it's a process, yeah, it's a process indeed. So um, to what extent the Cameron's statement is true or false might depend on our perceptions, on the context, and on theories and how we interpret those theories. The following theories, for example, um, the critical period hypothesis might uh, determine to a certain extent whether we think it's true or false. There is this hypothesis which is controversial and which has been largely discussed in the literature that states that children, you know, uh, go over a stage you know, regarding chronological age, for them to develop skills of pronunciation, fluency, and even accent-related affairs. So children who are five or six might be able to reproduce the sounds such as a native speaker, in this case, English native speaker. Right. Um, this hypothesis has been explored and even researched. Um, and there is this case of a, of a child, you know, called fetal child. It's very famous because everybody took advantage of this situation to do research. This child had no interaction at all. Okay, uh, this child actually discovered new ways for communication. And the importance of, of, of social interaction and culture does make an impact on language development. This is, this is the, you know, this is the, the these are the figures, you know, this, this is the data. Uh, however, you know, those sounds were impacted by the environment and what is around. So it's close related to Piaget's theory. And the critical period hypothesis was questioned, 
you know, was questioned because of this opportunity to do research. And of course, you what you need to do is to go and read LIBO, Spada, Kim. Uh, you could also read Cameron, Pinter. You could also uh, go for uh, Chomsky's theory of, of this uh, language acquisition device we got here, you know, which, which is close related to this hypothesis. And we're going to explore Krashen's hypothesis to contrast, you know, because according to Krashen, we can acquire language regardless the age factor by means of specifically comprehensible input which is something we're going to explore but we we all need to know how um you know uh, how language emerge and the different conceptions of language and to be critical and to say okay to what extent children learn better than adults. We need to, to wonder and we need to ask ourselves what to be competent at the language is. And that's why I decided to move communicative competence at the end of our units, because that's, that's going to be the, the conclusion of the course. What is to be communicatively competent? What is to be competent linguistically, what is uh, language competence, what is metalinguistic competence, and what is uh, language competence, okay? After revising the four skills of the language and the sub skills such as grammar and vocabulary. Because it might be all too easy to state that children learn better, that they find it easier to learn languages and to acquire languages. But are they really competent at the language? Well, that's something we need to explore, you know, and we need to conclude because that's going to be determined our teaching and learning. OK. Another factor that might affect language learning and language acquisition that emerged from some of your charts was this concept of the competition model according to uh, Cameron and Pinter. The influence of L1 on L2 usually happens in phenomena such as bilingualism, okay? But it also has an impact when learning languages. Just think of yourself when you're trying to come up with message and you want to transmit knowledge or you just want to express and speak up your mind and you can't find the words in a language but in another. So this is kind of a struggle uh, between um, two languages trying to carry meaning. Okay, if you want to read more about this uh, language related issues, you know, this is about ling linguistics. I strongly recommend reading Cameron and Pinter, OK, because this could also be a factor that affects. Language learning and language acquisition. OK, some other authors have explored this phenomenon and they have shed light uh, on the findings regarding uh, interference. Now, before going to Piaget, I want to share with you what I was trying to get at when I refer to a post-method approach, a post-method paradigm and perspective. We have been focusing on learners and we are supposed to be following a learning center teaching approach. OK, and that means that. Whatever we do in a classroom and whatever we plan is focused on learners needs. And that's good, you know, in my personal opinion, I think that's good. We can see the difference between Teaching, teaching center perspectives, methods, and learner center perspectives, which are 
approaches where you have a little bit more freedom to explore and implement. But what I want to discriminate is a learner-centered perspective and a learner-centered teaching. Because what I believe is that we need to focus on the language, okay? Yeah, it's important to know the learner's needs, their characteristics, the factors that affect learning, my characteristics as a teacher, the curriculum, the syllabus design, the philosophy of the school, the book we are about to use, the seating arrangement, the classroom management, the tone of voice, the instructions. But the most important thing for this perspective, that's why it's a perspective, is the language goals. Okay, the language goals, what we want them to learn regarding language and what you want to learn as students. That's the difference between a learning center perspective and a learning center teaching. Otherwise, you know, we would go from, um, you know, following a line and covering units without worrying about language goals. And if everything was covered, good. If it wasn't, well, maybe next time. So um, this is what, what I believe and what I've experienced regarding um, plenty of years of years doing research. Now, as I said, it's not that we're going to underestimate the differences between contexts and the differences uh, among learners. We all know now that teaching children is a totally different word because we read Harmer, right? And the age factor is, well, quite important, right? So we have different personalities, different characteristics, but also different stages. And we're about to check stages now with Piaget. If you take a look at this, children are more enthusiastic than adults. You know, they want to please the teacher. They uh, they are very intelligent. They question your your intelligence as well, but uh, they do it in a in a friendly manner. You know, um, they have short concentration spans, and, and, and you know they are they like to speak up their minds very easily. As I said at the beginning, Piaget was a biologist and an epistemologist as well. But his work had lots of impact on e pedagogy, teaching and learning processes, and psychology as well. His theory is called constructivism, okay, which is also known as active learning because of the concepts he uh, worked on. Learning is basically the individual's construction of knowledge by their own, by means of making sense of what is around them. One thing that I decided to include in the presentation is the um, importance of the environment, because if you can remember the previous session, we discussed behaviorism and the relationship between the nature, between nature, sorry, between nature and human beings. Well, somehow this behaviorist approach, you know, continue evolving with constructivism, but focusing on a specific concepts such as assimilation. This process called assimilation, according to Piaget, um, has to do with children, individuals, discovering new pieces of data, new information, and, you know, eventually knowledge from what happens around and what they are able to do with that information. For example, a child opening a bottle. A child might believe, you know, that 
a bottle can be opened with their hands. And every single bottle, um, every single bottle can be opened with, with, with their hands. This is, you know, a new uh, discovery for, for children, okay? And they'll start doing the same with bottles. This is a simulation of, you know, what they can do, whether by, by exploration, by trying out, you know, by taking action, and by observation skills. There is another site for learning according to Piaget, which is called accommodation. Once the new discovery, you know, what eventually we'll call knowledge and, and learning, um, was, took place, okay, there is this contact with the environment that places new challenges. For example, a bottle of wine. A bottle of wine can be opened with your own hands. And that's when children or individuals need to change this construction they have when they assimilate it. And that change is a deconstruction, a cognitive deconstruction. Okay, it, there is a deconstruction in the middle to then transform knowledge again for accommodating it, for contextualizing the previous um, cognitive processes. So it's a process that happens simultaneously for learning to take place. A bottle of wine can be opened with a bottle opener rather than with your own hands. Here, the uh, role of a more knowledgeable peer is not highlighted. So it's rather the action, the exploration the game, the, the, you know, when, when children play, which is important. Well, I was going to give you another example of, you know, how a babies, yeah, how babies um, explore and actually learn. You know, I can think of a child, a baby, yeah, let's say a baby who's crying because he wants to be fed, okay? Whenever they cry, the mother goes and they drink milk, okay? But then he discovers that a different tone in a different way of crying or moaning uh, can be employed for getting attention, you know, for emotions or, or just a, um, you know, uh, being hot, okay? So he's or she is actually exploring with the environment, identifying their own crying, their, their own sounds in order to get, you know, what they want. This emerges from, from needs, yeah? But eventually will uh, be transformed into solving problems or making decisions. This chart is an example of how the process of assimilation and accommodation take place. First, the new discovery. Then, the calibration of knowledge, implementing this new discovery. Then, another situation emerges, and there is this deconstruction of, you know, okay, it's not this way, it works the other way around or in a different fashion to finally accommodate the, 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 the new piece of information. And that is the process for learning to take place. The child, according to Piaget, uh, has to do with problem solving, as I said, you know, uh, the interaction of the world, the environment, and her own existence and perceptions for taking action 
and you know um, come up with learning outcomes. Okay, so this is basically the cycle, you know, which the Piaget proposes, and he sheds light on actions and an uh, exploration and a relationship with nature, with environment. This is, an, in other words, you know, this would be the process of exploration, play, and talk and, and talking things to others. Now he starts, you know, uh, um, paying attention to more knowledgeable peers, parents, teachers, adults as a whole. Okay, for this inner dialogue, which is doing and talking, we usually um, do things. Well, I don't know you, but I usually do things, and I trying to shape a model here with my hands and I'm talking to myself, you know, saying, OK, this goes here and here. OK, so it's something that happens simultaneously and it's part of your inner speech um, for, let's say this way, for Piaget, this inner speech was an individual, uh, an individual process. While for other scholars, this had to do with interaction and with our need for sharing knowledge. Well, I just gave you an example of exploration, but it would be uh, it would be a, a good idea to provide with another example of exploration, such as a child playing with a water. Um, that would be very straightforward, but in abstract terms, it could be the exploration of conversation with others. Now that we are trying to uh, land this issue into language, when we have this example of a conversation with others and playing with water, there are certain stages that Piaget provided with. And those have to do with uh, sequences and cognitive development. The first one is the sensory motor stage, you know, little children. And we'll see from zero to two years old. Pre-operational stage from two to seven years old. Concrete operational stage from seven to, um, let's say, 11. And then form an operational stage from 13 to adults. Okay, here you have a, an, explan an explanation, uh -huh. a, 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 the rational of the, of the stages. You know, you can see the differences regarding physical differences, cognitive differences, um, and, and, and well, um, it would be good to observe children, you know, to observe babies who are around your context or watching videos in order to actually identify the stages are accordingly established for, you know, a generalization. For the sensory motor one, you have the child learns to interact with the environment by using the hands, you know, touching. Pre-operational, the child's thinking is largely reliant on perception, but they gradually become more and more capable of logical thinking. There is one stage here of selfishness, egocentrism, and a kind of self-centeredness. Okay, everything goes around the child. If you are to teach children, of course, you need to be aware of this. And if you are not interested in teaching children, it doesn't matter. You know why? Because you need to know how they went through the process of learning languages. And that makes up their personality and learning style 
which is going to be dispersed in your classroom. OK. And for understanding your very own process of learning. The next one is concrete operational. OK, according to Piaget, this might be a turning point in the child's cognitive development because they start becoming logical, systematic and structured. OK, now for the last one, they achieve formal logic, you know, abstract terms. They are able to uh, discriminate jokes, etc. Pragmatics in terms of language. Um, well, this uh, chart is somehow controversial. It has been has been discussed through the years, and you know, while we're talking about the stages here, later on we'll take a look at modes of representation by Brunner, where individuals might go from one to the other, backwards and forwards. While these stages of development, you know, follow a line, it's a sequence, you cannot come back. Of course, you know, it's not about chronology because a child who's seven might be in a different stage from a child who's a six, by right? depending on their individual concerns and their individual characteristics. But once you go over the stage, you cannot come back, you know, and and, and that's what Piaget uh, contributed with. Some conclusions. Well, there are four stages of cognitive development. Good. Each of them is identified by specific characteristics. The stages of development are closely related to thinking from childhood to adolescence, the mental age, than the chronological age. So it's all cognitive. Level of achievement for each of the stages we, we uh, check is different because every single child is different and because the context plays a paramount role. Even though the appearance of these characteristics of the stages, children might be at different time, the sequence of the stages stay there, do not change. The child may operate at one level at one concept and a higher or lower level for another one. OK, so again, it's important to have general broad, uh, broad conceptions, but to be open for differences. OK. Implications well, for your teaching. It's not the same to teach children than to teach young adults, of course your activities are going to be quite different. Your planning is going to be completely diverse and, and distinct. And of course, your implementations are going to suffer changes from one context to another. OK, what I suggest is to think of this active learning theory when managing the classroom, you know, when a following any kind of approach or method for planning your classes. Sorry for the spelling mistake uh, with double S for planning your classes. Because these are the basis of learning and it's still in the agenda, in the educational agenda after many years. OK, so you know about it. You are going to read about this. Of course, you will see the, the references. You will check the, the critical period hypothesis, the competition model, active learning, assimilation, accommodation, and how this can be important in your classroom, you know. In your following tasks, hopefully, this is going to be taken into consideration. Now, for fixing the period of the stage, the same group of students should be uh, tested in different kinds of concepts. That's why an its analysis is very important before, you know, your 
you need a structure before your syllabus design, before you plan it. Because the lessons need to be played by keeping in view the individual cognitive level of the students as well as their concerns and needs. These are the references, Cameron and Pinter. This is for reading more about a PHS active learning. And then I, I strongly suggest reading them first. You know, it's, it's quite friendly. You can digest the information and then go to the main source of information and to read PHA after that. Okay, good. So this is what I wanted to share with you today. <coughs> Sorry. Active learning, the basis for learning. You will see how this has an impact on language learning because for next session, we're going to check Vygotsky's and Brunner's idea and how language plays the most important role for learning, you know, and, and also uh, different concepts as the zone of proximal development and scaffolding, which is, a, you know, a very important for online education this day and age and for uh, traditional approaches as well. Okay, um, do you have any comments, please, or or uh, something you want to share with us, with your classmates and or questions, Robert? No, uh, no I don't have any questions. Okay. Yes. Um, any, anybody else who wants to, uh, to comment something or to share your insights into the theory? The idea is to take the theory, to explore the theory, and to bear it in mind when doing your tasks, okay, when carrying out your activities so that they can be there somehow. Um, and it's, as I explained, as I said, the learning and teaching process in which we are focusing on, rather than the methodologies or the approaches, that's why we have a lot of theory, which might be sometimes boring, um, but necessary. Um, teacher? Yeah. Well, usually when I think about teaching, uh, mostly to children, I always think to teach uh, like with this approach, like this way, in a very active way where when I where I can, you know, like allow the students to find the knowledge by themselves by you know by uh well i don't know how to explain that but yeah um basically basing on, on this kind of methodology so i think this is probably the one i will use when i start teaching i uh, thank you for your comment alex you know you know what a constructivism is actually a present nowadays. Um, we have a lot of schools which follow constructivist approaches, primary schools, elementary schools, uh, high schools, the uh, even, you know, you know, at the University of Veracruz, we have the competences model. But some of us teachers actually follow a constructivist approach, you know, because this is this is not a method, not even an approach. It's a paradigm. And when I say that we follow this approach, which is a paradigm, is that we have a vision of education as you know uh, being actively involved in what is happening, and you know focusing on what is important regarding language or your area of knowledge. So a lot of teachers at university follow this and, and you know, at every, um, at, at any, any educational level, you know, because it's a way of seeing education as a whole, the, the complex arena of education, okay? It's not an approach for following in your classroom. 
that's different and that's something we you, you you're going to check when uh, revising uh, methods and approaches current you know current methods and approaches it's a different course but this is just an idea for understanding educational phenomena okay and it's very interesting to see how schools how this philosophy you know that had variations with Vygotsky but it was a follow-on you know it was a follow-up sorry as well as Brunner but they just focus on the more knowledgeable peers interaction and language routines and rituals next presentation we're going to check Vygotsky's social constructivism and Brunner's scaffolding concept okay and then we go over crashing just to go into language crashing's hypothesis comprehensible input and you know a, a nat the natural hypothesis so I think we are um, recovering the 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 necessary topics the, the theory that it makes up you know a little bit clearer the processes of teaching and learning and then we'll be able to uh, discuss on grammar on vocabulary on speaking writing and pronunciation etc anybody else thank you alex anybody else wants to share something no well not really um, I, i'm recording the session so i'm gonna stop recording this okay stop recording <laughs>